Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you for the invitation. Thank everybody for uh, coming. And I just want to say a special thing. It is, um, we went into this project of understanding these old things that nobody else was working on. It can be very, very lonely. Uh, we suckered Mark Kissin into it. So good, there's three of us. And so to get, um, uh, and we think it's like really fundamental. And to get support from, uh, it's been really meaningful, more than you know, that uh, Peter has been so incre incredibly supportive. So I won't get too mushy here, but you know. <laughs> But I could. But I could. Seriously, <laughs> for him, yeah. For him, he's like whatever. But you know, it's been very, very important to us, just uh, mentally. Um, okay. Anyway, so I just want to say uh, one of the themes of the lecture, one big theme has been, and this is what's going to be sort of more detailed today, is a kind of a Klein worldview, holistic worldview of Felix Klein, which is roots of polynomials, one variable polynomials. And this amazing connection between that and enumerative algebraic geometry problems, and then the theory of uh, congruence covers, I'll just call it modular functions, would be the old way to do it. And these guys were like solving, in, in the 1900s or 1800s, were solving uh, polynomials using transcendental functions and this amazing thing. And you'll see what I mean by this. And today I'm sort of going to talk about a topological approach. This is, sorry, all joint with Mark Kisson and Jesse Wolfson. Um, we're trying a lot of different methods, um, but let me just start out with uh, three basic uh, examples. So I'll call this algebraic functions everywhere. So consider uh, the following three algebraic functions. Actually, I'm going to move to this board. I'll just say this. Let phi be one of the following algebraic functions. Um, the first one I will call phi sub n roots of a1 to a n. And we saw this in all the talks so far. It's uh, this, quote, multivalued function, so this algebraic function uh, implicitly defined by a polynomial. Uh, so those are the coefficients of a polynomial, and it spits out the roots. OK, that's like the first example. The second example, I'm going to let g and n be greater than or equal to 1, maybe n greater than or equal to 2. Um, I'm going to call this torsion. It's the algebraic function that sends a principally polarized uh, g-dimensional abelian variety. Um, a um, to its set of n torsion points. That is an algebraic function. And we've seen these, uh, uh, oh, sorry, my colloquium, which I'm not going to assume that you have gone to. But what I mean is that you're literally putting in like the coefficients of the equations of an abelian variety. And then it's literally popping out like uh, equations describing the p torsion points. And the final one which I'm going to call phi lines, um, it's going to take uh, the set of, um, it's an algebraic function on this moduli space for the parameter space of smooth cubic surfaces, S, in P3. And one of the first theorems of, uh, great theorems of modern algebraic geometry is that every such thing, Cayley proves this, uh, has 27 lines. And so you can take it to the set of 27 lines. OK? Meaning these are linear forms. So you literally have a cubic polynomial. Um, great. And so the question I want to ask, the classical question, I'm going to leave this available, is that the classical question that encompasses a lot of questions of uh, Klein, Hilbert, Hermit, all these people, they were working on the following classical questions which is given phi as above, what is the minimal d such that after, now there's two different problems I want to pose, or two different families of problems. The first is, 
such that after a rational change of coordinates, so you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, hit, hit the coordinates of the rational function, so a rational change of coordinates, and we'll see examples. And problem B is a rational change of coordinates plus adjoining less complicated functions like adjoining radicals, uh, icosahedral function, other algebraic functions. That was in Jesse's talk, um, et cetera. And these are called accessory rationalities. So this is in the middle of the sentence. I know I haven't completed my sentence yet. What's the minimal D such that after either you can change coordinates rashly or, or start adding simpler equations? Um, so if that um, phi can be written as an algebraic function of D variables. So this includes a huge number of classical problems, and they're related, and in fact, one of the beautiful things to me, we'll see the problems one, two, and three are related. And just to more formally, um, let me put to this thing in, in terms of what Jesse did yesterday, let me recall the definition. An algebraic function, maybe I'll put it here, sorry, um, classical questions. So an algebraic function is nothing more than a branched cover. It's a generically finite dominant rational map, but it's a branched cover over Zariski open. And then there's another piece of data. You're picking like a primitive element. But you'll see what I mean in a second. Well, let me just give the examples. OK? So here you have uh, the parameter space of all uh, polynomials p plus a1, z to the n minus 1, plus a n. So this is just some affine n space. You're just recording the coefficients. And there's a branched cover, branched over the discriminant locus. I'll call it p twiddle roots. It's a set of polynomials equipped with a root. right? And that's an n-sheeted branch cover. The generic fiber has n points. So those are the solutions of the polynomials. Those are distinct solutions. OK, so any questions here? So this is like a branch covering. And we're going to give the topological interpretation of the problem after I give the topological interpretation, not interpretation, equivalent to an algebraic function. Here, you have AG. It's the moduli space of g-dimensional principally polarized abelian variety. Don't worry about the print. Either you know principally polarized or not. It's just. Um, a minor piece of data, <laughs> sorry, but I mean, it's not key in this discussion. It make, helps you make a modular space. Um, and this is a very beautiful thing. It's a locally symmetric variety. You're taking Ziegel upper half space, g dimensional, and you're modding out by the symplectic group. So our favorite case is g equals 1. You have the hyperbolic upper half space, and you're modding out by SL2z. OK, so this is some beautiful algebraic variety. and. Um, it parameterizes these things. And now there's a cover, A, G, N. And I'll just say, it's the set of A in A, G. Um, it's a set of pairs, sorry. A comma um, X, where N, X is 0 and A. It's just things equipped with a P torsion point, or an N torsion point. Okay, These things are additive groups. Think of their complex tori. You can think of them additive groups in the obvious way. And so it's the n torsion points. And this is going to be a, um, however many n torsion points there are, n, uh, n to the g sheeted cover. Um, just for experts and even non-experts, this is an n sheeted cover. I could take the normal closure of this cover. Like there's an Sn cover where you list all the roots and all their you know, orderings. Um, they're sort of equivalent theories, so I'll be going back and forth a little. Here, you have this beautiful thing. You have the moduli space of smooth cubic surfaces, the parameter space. So what I mean by that, so S and P3, let me just say what that is. What you do, the space of all cubic surfaces 
in P3. So if you're a projective three space that's four variables, and I want all homogeneous polynomials of degree three, right? And they cut out a, um, uh, a hypersurface, so you get a cubic surface. If you and I have the if you take the same polynomial multiplied by a complex number, non-zero complex number, it has the same zero set. So the space of all cubic surfaces is just this projective space, which, by the way, it's P19. And then the condition for being smooth is some polynomial condition. It's not obvious, but it's actually a hypersurface. And this is an incredibly singular hypersurface called the discriminant locus. So there's a very complicated object. Um, anyway, so that's this space. It's very concrete. Um, I'll talk a little more about it later. And here I'll call it M twiddle line. It's a set of pairs, S comma L, such that L is contained in S, and L is a line. So it's a, it's a copy of P1. It's a linear P1. So it's not just that it's isomorphic, there's a line. A line is a copy of P1 and P3. And I had these great videos, and if you missed them, and Jesse too, then you know, what can I do? OK, so any questions? Those are the algebraic functions. And let me just rephrase these in terms of topology as well. Um, and oh, yes, all the maps to P1 are just like, it, it maps to lambda, for example. It's to the second thing, you know what I mean, to the object. But that's not going to be the key thing for us today, because you can see, um, the fr you can phrase things without that, where it's sort of implicit. And so let me uh, uh, here give the rephrasing of this, and it's called the essential dimension. So um, definition, uh, it's ED, but it's essential dimension of a finite uh, branch cover over Zersky open is defined to be the minimal D uh, such that there exists the following diagram. You have x twiddle over x, and I'm positing the existence of some other branch cover. And I'm positing the existence. Everything's going to be a rational map. So allow me to do solid arrows, please where this is a pullback diagram, and um, the dimension of y, and hence of y twiddle, uh, is equal to d. And we'll see a bunch of examples. That's the same thing as you change, the rational map is the rational change of coordinates. And d parameter equation with d variables is exactly this. So I'll give an, let me give an example. This one I will rephrase later. I'm going to let it come up kind of generically. So let me give the first example that you learn either as an undergrad. It's the first theorem in Kummer theory. I'm going to phrase it geometrically. So the due to, due to Kummer, um, the essential dimension of a cyclic cover, um, let me say this. Yeah, let me say it this way. This is, this is great. I'm going to do infinitely many at once. For all coverings, x twiddle goes to x, where it's a normal covering with z mod dz. Okay, So this is for all d greater than or equal to 2. So d greater than or equal to 2. So this is amazing. For all such things, there exists maps from p1 to p1. Sorry, there exists rational maps to p1, where this covering is the standard z goes to z to the d. And this is a pullback. What I like to say to people to freak them out, I always say there's no such thing as a cyclic group acting on a variety. That doesn't exist. It's an illusion, except for this one. Everything's just a pullback from this. That's pretty amazing. From a field theoretic point of view, you all learn this in Kummer theory when they, he, Kummer says what every cyclic extension is. Every cyclic extension of any pair of fields, as long as you contain the d roots of unity, you know, wherever the complex numbers, is a pullback from this. That's sort of an amazing property. I never thought about it in terms of varieties. And so in particular, oh, sorry, let me just finish the sentence. In particular, for any such x, ed of x twiddle to x is equal to 1, because it's pullback from a one-dimensional. Sorry, the question? Um, no, well, it's just this is also a um, generically finite dominant rational map. 
So you can take away as a risky, you can pass as risky open, and it's a covering space. You're not talking about like computer transfer. No, no, just algebraic. Um, and um, yeah, great. And so that's a great way for some, this is somehow a universal example. It's called versal because it's not necessarily unique. There's other things, that's a, but it's um, not unique, meaning you can have higher dimensional varieties with cyclic actions that have this property, that everything's a pullback. Oh, actually, this one you can't. But anyway, um, this is called versal. So it's a much stronger thing than just saying essential dimension of all such branch covers. It's all coming from one mechanism. And let me give another example that's fundamental here, and that's beautiful and due to Felix Klein, and it's the main example of his beautiful book on the icosahedron, which is translated. Um, so you can say, is the same true for, uh, so A5 acts, and I'm doing just the complex numbers now, but you could do this over any field where an A5 is, has a representation on P1. I guess you need like fifth roots of unity or something. Anyway, right, you have this action. Is it true that any A5 action on any variety is pulled back from this? And if so, why didn't I learn this in the first year graduate class when I was in, when I was in undergrad? But, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. But, uh -oh, can you erase that on the video? Um, right, is that true? And why didn't we learn it? That would be amazing. Now, it's not true. Not true. In fact, um, if you look at the essential dimension, in fact, of the space of quintic polynomials, I know this is not an A5 action, it's an S5, but let me lie. It's equal to 2. It's not equal to 1. And you'd be equal to 1 if you were pullback of a one-dimensional, right? But he discovered this thing. He discovered that for all A5 covers, again, branch covers, generically finite dominant maps. So I like to think of branch cover over its risky open. I'm just going to call them covers. For all A5 actions on any variety, there exists the following setup. It's not true that this sort of compresses down onto the icosahedral action on P1. Right? This action is this beautiful action by the icosahedron, symmetry of the icosahedron. It's not true. But what you do, there's some map, some rational maps like this. And this is A5, and this is A5. Oh, sorry, no. Oh, yes, this is A5, and this is A5. But there's some cover, a two-sheeted cover. So you take your A5 action. You can, it's like adjoining a square root, right? Up there, that's like. That's what it means to like adjoin a dth root, is you pull back z goes to z to the d. In this dictionary, that's what it means to adjoin a dth root. So after adjoining a square root of something, usually some discriminant, um, um, so there exists this picture such that y um, compresses down to the p1 action. So Comer's theorem, it's actually, I think, deeper, much deeper than Comer's theorem, because it's not true. You need to add a, a joint radical. And this is called um, Klein's normal form sots. And I only know one place in the literature except for Klein where it exists. I, this was completely forgotten, eh? as far as we can tell. Or maybe there's, oh, OK, maybe I'm missing some. Um, OK, any questions? And so what I, would do, what I would say is that this example, somehow I'd call this z mod 2z versal, which means it's a uni By the way, versal, you should just read universal. It's just there's uniqueness issues. You don't want to. But it's z2 versal, meaning you can always adjoin a z do a z2 cover, but then it's got this universal property. So there's still almost no A5 actions on any varieties except, I mean, there's lots of different ones, but you're adjoining a root. So, so any questions? Yes. 
Um, it's related to the Bring radical. It ends up being able to solve the Bring radical. But, but you have to actually adjoin the square root as well. Yes. So that, right. Jesse had these repeated diagrams. and. So one of the things that um, somehow I think this was implicit in work of Klein, um, and um, it must have appeared throughout the last hundred years, but one thing that we defined, we want to define is the following. Let um, capital epsilon be some collection of, um, they're going to be called accessory irrationalities in the language of Klein. It's going to be some collection of uh, branched covers. We'll have lots of examples. Like you could take um, all composition of cyclic branch covers. That's some like collection of branch covers. We like make something a category and do all this stuff. But anyway, you just have a collection of rules you're allowed to use. Or it can be all solvable covers, where you're sort of allowed to add any radicals. And then um, the definition is um, a cover, a specific cover. I'll call it Z-twiddle. Or let me see, what was it called over there? Well, it was called P1. So uh, a specific cover Z-twiddle over Z is epsilon-versal if um, it's epsilon-versal for a specific group. So let me assume this is a G cover, like it's a normal cover with deck group G. For this finite group G, if for all, and now you know what I'm going to say, if you give me any like G action on X twiddle, on a variety X twiddle, I don't have to phrase this covering spaces, but any G action on the variety X twiddle, there exists, uh, there exists like a Y twiddle, a G cover. The key thing is there exists this map right here. That's, and this map, this cover, lies in the collection of covers epsilon. Such that you first pull it back using covers in epsilon. And then such that, so y twiddle over y is pulled back from my thing. So in other words, z twiddle over z is a kind of universal model for G actions on all varieties up to these epsilons, OK? Um, so let me give some examples. But this is sort of fits in with a lot of classical math. And it, I think it opens up a lot of really interesting questions. But um, first, are there any uh, questions? Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of, oh, sorry, you're right. I'm sorry. It's things that you're allowed to do. You're given an arbitrary guy. Let me just, you want a single object that's universal. This is the guy. Ready? I want him to be universal. Every G axon and every variety is pulled back from him. That's, rarely, that's true very rarely, as you already saw there. It's true for cyclic groups. But I want to allow you to take any G axon any variety, take a branch cover, And, um, and then that compresses to G. Here's why people, Kronecker and Klein, Kronecker was like, this is horrible and ugly. And then Klein said, in other words, that you have to do this. It's called accessory rationality. It doesn't change the Galois group. So you can't use Galois theory. You can't use Galois theory. And so Klein responded to Kronecker. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, roughly, um, are, we, are we men of science? Um, we wouldn't face with new phenomena, uh, adjust our preconceived notions, or do we hold a fixed dogma and reject what nature presents us? Right. So <laughs> this is what this is what nature is presenting. This is the phenomenon. This is the phenomenon. You might think it's like ugly, but it's not. Of course, now I think it's much more subtle and beautiful. And you can't see it with Galois group. And finally, I should say um, this theorem. Klein called it. <laughs> 
By the way, I am hardcore. My son is Felix, after Felix Klein. So I put my money where my mouth is. <laughs> yeah, what's your daughter's name, Peter? Um, <laughs> Emmy? Um, so, um, ba yeah. <laughs> Basically, you can sort of, right. So um, I want to talk about epsilon versality and modular functions. Because the amazing thing is there's a lot of G mod K mod gammas. So classically, people like Hermit, it's great. He has solutions to the cubic. It's like sine alpha. You have to normalize, right? It's always the three solutions are like sine alpha, sine two alpha, sine three alpha. For, you know, it's amazing things. And they were led to this, I think, because uh, these modular functions are universal in some, or epsilon versal in some sense. Right. So people who study another way to say these things, um, you can rephrase this in Jesse said about finding like rational points and varieties. That's like versal respect to epsilon is the ident is like the trivial group. Finding a solvable point. But now we're just saying find a point where the, the varieties you can use are lower dimensional or whatever. You can do anything you want. And those really occur. So let me just give example. Example one would be if you take affine space, affine space mod g is epsilon versal for g actions, where, um, where epsilon is the trivial group. OK? This is great. And this is Hilbert theorem 90. I'll let you do this from Hilbert theorem 90, depending on which statement. Not the one for cyclic groups, the general one about GLN torsors. Okay? The problem is these are hugely high dimensional things. G has to be faithful. Right. I think this was first written down in Bueller Reichstein, who were uh, the people who defined essential dimension. Sorry, I should have said this Bueller Reichstein. Um, and let me say, too, you can, I'm not going to do it today, but you can define the essential dimension of a cover, sort of, and then I can allow you rules of the game to, uh, uh, instead of just being a rational change of coordinates, I can allow you, like, you're allowed to do solvable. You're allowed to add radicals. OK, so let me just give examples. Number two is an incredibly beautiful example. When you have a5, when g is a5, um, and the collection of covers, I want to be just z2 covers, z mod 2z covers. And as you know, you have p1 over p1 is z2 versal. I just did that. But what's great is if you take the hyperbolic plane mod the level 5 subgroup, so gamma 2 of L is going to be the kernel from SL2Z to SL2Z mod LZ. Sorry for the word. And I'm going to need later gamma 2 L twiddle. It's the same thing for PSL2. Anyway, OK? So you have the level 5 congruence cover of the modular curve, these are, and you have the duck deck group here is SL2, F5. Don't, P, I think I want SL2, F5, or no, PSL2, sorry, F5. And um, this is versal. Why? Because this is a copy of P1. It's a little less well known. To people, I mean, it's well known from the 18th century, 19th century, but this is the modular curve, which you've probably seen. And that's a copy of P1, and this is isomorphic to A5. So Klein's thing is actually modular, and in fact, he literally like wrote down a modular function that like solves the quintic by doing this. It's like all of math. Yeah, it's great. It's great. And that's what we love about this subject, is that it's all massive generalizations of these. I mean, you know, there's so many more things to explore. And, um, so any questions so far? So that's the first modular example. Um, what's the next one I get to? Oh, this is a great one. OK. Um, <laughs> two, yeah, I'll just say it again to be precise. Let gamma 2, 7 twiddle be the kernel of the map. 
It's just a subgroup of SL2Z, but you map to PSL2F7. Okay? And so I'm going to take, um, this is a really cool one that's sort of, um, so theorem, let epsilon be any collection of, um, that contains all like S4 covers of varieties. Okay, now that's a solvable group. So I'm throwing in all S4 covers of all varieties, but of course it ends up being that I sort of need iterated P1, you know. So this is not a, but you need this, this is cool. So um, um, S4 covers, then if you look at uh, the hyperbolic plane, so here's some modular curve covering the mother of all modular curves. Um, and the group acting is PSL2 F7 is versal, is epsilon versal for PSL2 F7. And this is, um, this example is due to Klein. PSL2 F7 is like the next biggest finite simple group after A5. And I want to prove this for you because the things that we do in our papers are sort of uh, much more involved, but it's in the same spirit, I would say. I mean, we're using bailey borel compactification and stuff like that, but it's in the same spirit. And I should say, um, in particular, oh, I wanted to find one more concept maybe. Um, you know, let me say this and then I'll give a, um, more examples of versal things. Um, great. Okay, so what do I want to do? Um, proof. Wow, it's going. I started at like 1.30, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, let me just say. No, no, no. I don't want to go over. Yeah. Um, Yesterday there was a reason. There was a working seminar that was right. supposed to test the environment. Right. But we had to switch. Right. No, that's what, so the first thing to say is you can prove that uh, there's this beautiful representation of PSL2F7 um, is just versal. So here it's with respect to the trivial group. Uh, so this is, in other words, we have a two-dimensional example that's versal for PSL2 F7. That's because um, this is the uh, projectivization of a linear action. And so it's, um, it's very much like the linear case. So let me just leave it at that. But then what Klein realizes, Klein gets an embedding of this modular curve. So this is this beautiful curve. I'll call it. Uh, Q, you'll see why. Well, this is this beautiful curve. Its genus is three, okay, and it has some punctures. And PS, this huge group of order 168 acts on it. And Klein shows that the, you get the canonical embedding of this. You act on holomorphic one forms, you get a representation, you get the canonical embedding. It embeds it in, there's this beautiful, uh, Embedding into P2 in the image, yeah, is a cortex, is a smooth cortex in P2. And this map is PSL2F7 equivariant. So the, these nonlinear isometries of this curve come from linear isometries of the, of the thing. And what you do is you fix, let me just explain it since for time reasons, here's a cortex. What you do is you fix an identification that's invariant by PSL2F7. You fix like an inner product that's invariant. The thing with its dual that takes x to its dual line. And now you get a map. So, so sorry. So the whole name of the game here, I'm sorry, is to, since that's versal, if I can compress that, I want to get a map to Klein's thing. That's PSL2F7 equivariant. I, I want to compress the universal thing down to another universal thing, right? A smaller dimension. So what you do is 
here's a map. I, I want a map from P2 to the Klein cortex. And what you do is, given a point x, I take it, uh, I'm first going to map it to uh, m04. Yeah, sorry, let me just say it in words. It's going to take too long. Given a point, you take the dual line corresponding to that point. OK, there's a dual line corresponding to that point. It intersects at four, four points, a set of four unordered points, when a copy of uh, 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 P1, no, on the, cop, it's on the cortex. And basically, you map it to the cortex. I need to get a point on the cortex. I'm trying to get this map. And what you do, you just map it to point number one. But there's a problem. <laughs> the, po the points aren't ordered. So you take a four, an S4 cover with a set of the, all the points and all the orderings, and then point number one is ordered. So that's why I have to take the cover, and then you get that point, and that's the compression of thing. That's really beautiful. And um, I guess I won't do the one. There's lots of like Hilbert modular varieties. There's many more examples that we have in our papers, but I want to give a proof of our key. Th so Hilbert modular, uh, Picard modular. Oh, we don't get to do all these fun things. This is like the baby case of all these beautiful ones. Some come from the classical literature, but we discovered some too, like epsilon versal for different classes of epsilon. And I think it'll be really interesting to, you know, Picard modular varieties and other kinds of things. Um, great. So, um, in fact. Um, um, no, there's definitely non-rational. Why this theory, I think, is more interesting, is quite interesting, is because you get lots of, at least, but maybe this doesn't answer your question. You get lots of like non-rational varieties, at least. Yeah, so it's not. Yes. 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 Yes, it's congruent subgroup. That's because we're, we're dealing with mod. Right. Oh, and this is perfect timing. This is perfect timing for problem B. OK, so there's lots of these examples. But let me say, for problem B, so we see that you have this notion of essential dimension. You also have a notion where you can do this whole dimension thing, but I'm now allowing to replace my original variety with one where I, I can um, sort of adjoin something from epsilon. I, I can do a branch cover first and then compress it down. But suppose I just don't want to have any restrictions whatsoever. And that's what resolvent degree is. That's like the real question. So the resolvent degree, and this one is um, Brouwer was the first to define it, and then Arnold Shimura, and they didn't know of Brouwer. They gave the same definition in 1976, a year later. This exact definition, they did it in purely Galois theoretic terms for field extensions, but I'm going to give it geometrically. The resolvent degree of x twiddle over x is the minimal d such that the following is true. So you have x twiddle over x. And what I want is that, well, I first want to um, I'm allowed to take some um, like branch cover of x and then a branch cover of that with no restrictions on the cover, yeah, all the way up to like e sub r. Ah, sorry, let me give uh, e sub r minus 1. And where the final thing is like a pullback diagram. So I'm allowed to do a bunch of things. And the only restriction is that the essential dimension of vi plus 1 over ei is less than or equal to d. So it's sort of allowing me arbitrary moves. It's just doing dimension. This, I think, is the real name of the game. And let me talk about now the, what Hilbert's questions are and the theorems that Jesse and I and Jesse Mark and I proved, some using, I'm all using like very classical things and some more modern things, including different compactifications of locally symmetric varieties. But this resolvent degree of a cover is the following. So here's, 
So go over to here. Just start here first. <laughs> if you look at the theory of polynomials, you can ask, what is the resolvent degree of the algebraic function given a, um, a degree six uh, uh, the coefficients of a degree six polynomial, find a root, or find all of its roots? And Hilbert conjectured explicitly in 1927 in one of his last papers, it's called the Sextic Conjecture, that it's equal to 2. And it corresponds to classically, Hamilton had already gotten shown that you, you can reduce, after adjoining some radicals, you can reduce every sextic to this one. And, Hilbert was, and there was a huge industry of reducing numbers of coefficients. Hilbert was the first one to say, is this, I don't think you can lower this to 1. And that's literally this conjecture. The Hilbert 13th problem, which he stated in his ICM talk, is for 7. And he got it down to 3. He himself, I think he himself, maybe Hamilton, got it down to 3. And he thinks that's the best. There's the octic, and there's the nonic. And that's what he conjectured. And of course, it should go to infinity. There's lots of great questions. OK, any questions? There's no known lower bound on RD. RD could be 1. There's no known example of any branch cover, finite branch cover, where RD is bigger than 1. It's the biggest problem by far in the area. It's very hard, and you'll see why, maybe. Um, yes? Nope, nothing. Nope, nope. Oh, if there were reversal respect to like cyclic covers, yeah, that would prove it's one. So you can translate it for like the epsilon, which are essentially be one. Because the point essentially, point yes, two. yes, you could do that. Yes, if you could find it. But find a curve that isn't that long that would look perfect. Right. You could. Yeah. Right. Given <laughs> given Klein's proof, we start looking around for all the other miracles and we check them, the ones that we could find. So here's a numerative geometry problems. I won't write down the covers and everything like that. But you can, given 27 lines on a smooth cubic surface, suppose you not only give me one line, you give me like a double six of lines. That's just some specific famous configuration of pairs of sixes. We prove that the resolving degree of this problem is equal to the resolving degree of this. And we prove that that's equal to the resolving degree of these branch covers. Two torsion. So this is the problem of, this is like two torsion on PPAVs. And these are coming from beautiful symplectic representations of Dixon. And we were both Dixon instructors. Kissin came as an assistant professor. But anyway, at Chicago. Um, and hiding under these things are these beautiful exceptional isomorphisms of finite simple groups, is hiding under these. And we have like a meta conjecture that somehow every isomorphism between f uh, finite groups that's like surprising is coming from these like different moduli spaces. And I'll just, there's 28 bitangents on a smooth planar cortex given an Aaron Hold set. And I bet you thought Aaron Hold sets were esoteric, but they're, and they are, but they're equal to, OK? So I'm just giving, and it's um, these different mods are a variety. So any questions? Is equal? Right. And we were saying yesterday, we sort of think of this like a kind of p equals np. Resolving degree could always equal 1, which is doubtful. But um, it's at least giving a way to like compare between things. And I, for all of these, we essentially prove different covers are, I think this is correct, we essentially prove a kind of epsilon versality for appropriate epsilon, where you're allowed to use things of resolving degree three or less. In other words, I'm allowed to prove, like, uh, this problem is versal. I can take some appropriate moduli space and branch cover and adjoin these accessory rationality, you know, pull it back and pull it back and pull it back via things that are um, themselves pulled back from, like, th three variable. Right, so if I do that for this, and for this, with different, even with different epsilons, they're both like universal in some sense. It doesn't affect RD. So then that implies RD is the same. Yeah, good question. OK. Are these algorithms? You, you had a way of doing a gesture. Right. That, that's true. And what's beautiful is to work those algorithms out explicitly is really neat. So you um, can use like an explicit set of steps for like this. You can. We don't. And even. <laughs> Let me just mention this. No, but I mean, even the problem, like Joe Harris proved in 1979, if you give me three skew lines on a smooth cubic surface, there's a formula in radicals for the rest. It's just because some cover is solvable, right? Some, the mod value of smooth cubics equipped with three lines versus equipped with 27, that's a solvable cover. Um, Jesse and I gave a mini course two years ago, like a, or a year ago, last summer, um, and I said in the middle of my talks, you know, it would be great to actually see a formula in radicals. 
you know, Joe Harris's thing was known to Camille Jordan, but like, what is the formula? And these, uh, I forget the name, we'll, we'll send it out to you if you want. Is, um, th these guys who were taking our thing, they just sent us last week a beautiful paper where they actually, it's like a 20 page paper where they work out in a beautiful way the equations. So in other words, my point is just that showing something's even solvable by radicals, I think it's really interesting and beautiful to like work it out explicitly. And Thank you. And then here it's even more interesting because some of the things are barely, we're using Bailey Burrell compactification, but you want explicit expressions. And so that would be great to do. And that's something we haven't done. We do when we can, but you know. Um, OK. So I want to take the last 10 minutes. Yeah, I don't want to go. I want to take the last, uh, oh, we're seven minutes. That's OK. Um, to step back for a second and give one example of a lower bound and how we can prove it. And some, <laughs> sorry, yeah, it's hard to know what to do. You dive right in. Um, so we've been working really, really hard for two years, Jesse and I for three or four years, to prove that RD is bigger than one for this exit conjecture. And yes, I should say this, and this is true in this thing. This is, is cool that these are equivalent, but we actually are using this in a fundamental way. We're using this equivalence. So we're working over here, because this is a G mod K mod gamma, the like a Shimura variety. I mean, there's a whole, th and so you have all this arithmetic and piatic hodge theory and all these tools that absolutely don't exist for these. And so this is really used, which is what I like. We're using these classical things. Um, but now I just want to talk about Klein's problem. So my original algebraic functions, I don't know if this was the board. Yeah, these two original problems, this problem, people did it for polynomials. Hermit was working on that. People did it for lines on a smooth cubic. And let me just say it in words. If you take this, a rational change of coordinates, if you want to find a line on a smooth cubic surface, the lines, it's a 19-dimensional problem a priori because the moduli space is 19 dimensional. You give me 19 coefficients of your polynomial. Can you do better by rationally changing coordinates? The answer is yes, because PGL4 acts on projective three space, taking lines to lines. And that's a 15 dimensional group. So what that means, you can actually like classically literally change coordinates linearly with those linear transformations and you get it down to a four-dimensional problem. So the, um, this problem for s lines on a smooth cubic is less than or equal to four. And in fact, Klein and Burkhart proves it's less than or equal to three. And they related these different problems. Klein was the one who related smooth cubic surfaces to like A2, 3, and da, da, da. But then he asked, how about, he, Klein asked, because he was trying to actually lower it, what is the essential dimension? If you want to find n torsion points, on an abelian variety, uh, what is it? What's, what's the number of variables do you need? OK? And that's what we answered. It was great seeing him actually like make reductions, and he's like literally working on this. And we were able to just give the exact answer. The answer, and he had this as an upper bound, but the obvious upper bound is a lower bound. You can't do anything. t plus 1, choose 2. OK? And I want to say where this number comes from and how you prove such a thing. And then um, um, if you're interested afterwards, because I don't want to go over, you can ask me, um, why is resolving degree harder? <laughs> so much harder. And proof sketch. So let me just say, you want the following. It's a birational problem. So I'm just going to say, you want for all divisors in AG, it's all about Zariski opens, because with algebraic, I'm just telling you what the thing is. If you take A, G, N, uh, you take A, G, and you take this cover, and then you take A, G minus a divisor, and you take sort of the, all the lifts. Okay, this is your setup with a billion uh, N torsion points and stuff, and I don't care to do it everywhere. I just want to do one of those risky open. I want to say, if it compresses down, to some lower dimensional variety. And the group acting here is sp2g 
uh, I'll just say FP. I'll do it for a prime or something. OK? And here it'll be SP 2GFP. And if the dimension of y, then the dimension of y has to be at least g plus 1 choose 2, which is the dimension of AJ. That's what we want. Like if you compress it, you're compressing it to something in the same dimension. OK? Let me say our real theorem, our second theorem. So this, there's other methods. I'm going to give a topological proofs. So um, 2018, we proved it with um, deformation theory of finite, I'll just say piatic Hodge theory, but it's deformations of finite flat group schemes. And the advantage of this um, is that it's absolutely true that there's, for the, we did this really for locally symmetric varieties, like in congruence covers. In the case when your variety is projective, all known methods are out the door, and I don't think there's any of them have any chance of working. But this method works. This is an arithmetic method. But <laughs> um, we haven't written it up. But, uh, so I'd like to talk about, like, I guess, work in progress, which I'm going to tell you now is like a topological proof uh, for the non-co-compact only. And since I'm really running out of time, let me just give the key steps. But any questions as to the setup? No, you need to come up with, you need to come up with an obstruction. And one of the problems about using topology, I think topology is fundamental in this. Wait, uh, this is not proving the, this is some condition. No, this is proving this. This is, what oh, sorry, for non-compact only. It's things that have toroidal compact, right, non-uniform lattices, so quasi-projective that are not projective. It's well known ever since Selberg. Are you using congruent subgroup property? Um, no, we're not using the congruent subgroup property. You'll see what I'm using, that there's a compactification. And unipo I'm using unipotence, which is like, this is ever since Selberg, like rigidity, everything's easier. In some, sorry, a lot of things are easier for the non-compact. The co-compact, it kills all the known methods. But anyway, so step one is find a perturbable torus. And what I mean by that, I want to find a torus sitting inside AG, where n is of the right dimension, with the property that for all z, for all divisors, I can literally per homotope the torus um, to some new torus. So what do I want to say? Ah, so I can homotope the torus so that you're actually contained in AG minus Z to AG. Forget that AG is an orbifold. That's not a big deal. And where the fundamental group at the pi 1 level, the fundamental group of the torus is Z to the n. And I want this to be uh, Z to the n, Z to the n. And I want this to just be just an isomorphism. So I want it to be not just an incompressible torus, but I want it to be detecting. And in fact, I want more than this. I want to look at, this is a unipotent for a Siegel parabolic. So if, for, for the experts, uh, stabilizer of Lagrangian submanifold. It's a specific unipotent, but it's um, isomorphic to z to the n. So I, what I want to say is, I have a torus that no matter how do you try to kill me, but killing it by taking out a sub-variety, I can move it and miss. OK? And um, OK, so let me draw the picture. So, so step 1a is I'm going to tell you what the torus is. And what the torus is, and this is like a really tough thing. So this is my picture of. AG, and then here's the toroidal compactification. It's an incredibly <laughs> sophisticated, difficult thing. But around each divisor, so th this locally, this is, the key thing is this is a smooth compactification with normal crossings. That's the first key thing. I wouldn't need toroidal if that's all I needed. But when you have that, what it looks like locally 
near the boundary, holomorphically, it's only holomorphic, to C star to the n. And so you have like a little loop around this divisor. These divisors are complex codimension one. So you think of a line in, right, it's a hyperplane. You have a little loop around it, and you have a little loop around here. And where they intersect, you get like it's a torus. Right? And then you have this kind of stratification. OK, so it's C star to the n. And there, I'm going to do n is 2. I know that doesn't occur in our case, but n is 2. And here's a torus of radius epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Right, it's a family of tori in C star plus C star. Why we need toroidal compactification? We can't just say it's some mystery z to the n. We really need it to be unipotent, so it's detecting the right monodromy and all this stuff. We really need it to represent specific elements and even an explicit right. So we're piggybacking on a 500-page construction. But it's pretty, and then this is a really fun thing. Exercise. And, and we literally do this exercise after applying virus trust preparation. If you give me a polynomial, if you take this torus, the epsilon 1, epsilon 2 torus, show that you can pick epsilon, epsilon 1, epsilon 2 um, in the complement of the vanishing locus of any given polynomial. That's an exercise. And now you do that locally here. So now, why did I just do this? And this will end the kind of proof. This will end our proof. That's step one. I mean, I'm making it sort of easy, but. Um, step two, now we have the following thing. You restrict the whole picture to the end torus, and because you have control in the monodromy, I could just walk into the room in the first second. You might know nothing. And I can say, um, uh, John, who's a smart undergrad at Chicago, I can see, suppose you have a z mod, let me, z mod pz to the r, or to the n, covering like this, of a torus over a torus, OK? Suppose I have that. And now look at just continuous maps, not rational. Defined everywhere, it's continuous maps to some lower dimensional thing, into some lower dimensional thing, mod pz to the end, all continuous or smooth, you can make it, where the dimension, then, then this implies the dimension of y is at least n. And this is use uh, characteristic classes. This is also an exercise if you know the theory of character. But this is purely in topology world. It's a manifold to a manifold. You can ask a cool question. Given a specific cover, when is it the pullback of a lower dimensional cover? Yep, every map here. Oh, these are covering maps. But they are algebraic. Yes. Well, yes, but then these are continuous maps. And these are algebraic, but you don't need it. But let me just end by saying that, great, so that's how you get the, the end of the proof. So the obstruction ends up being somehow the dimension of this torus would go down. And it's these unipotents at infinity that are controlling everything. And what's cool is in the piatic Hodge theory thing, we actually sort of guess this coming from, we use like uh, uh, the ramif ramification uh, and kind of, and anyway, we, we sort of, but let me just say the difficulty. There's two difficulties. You already saw there's like a birational difficulty where I can kill, try to kill any one of your proofs by taking out a sub variety. So you have to deal with that. And number two, if I'm allowed to start taking covers, Right? Resolvent degree. Suppose you want to prove resolvent degree is equal to that. I'm allowed to start taking covers. I can just take the cover corresponding to z mod pz to the n, and I get a trivialization. So somehow you have to do something that's going to live even when you take finite covers. So one of the ingredients we use, so out of nothingness, you have to get like a torus or something. Out of no, so we use the congruence subroot property as one of the tools. And another tool we're currently using is the theory of Bray groups. Anyway, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you.